What I just done read. I have it on good authority that the dead and the living can never be one. Hello and welcome back to What I Just Done Read. This is my Bohemian Book Corner and this is a book review show that attempts to give a fair airing to books and stories of all ages, not just those currently gracing the bestsellers or the new releases lists. Or something like that. Anyway, thank you for joining me again and for, uh, I suppose, the last time for this year, a happy Halloween to all. Hopefully you have celebrated the season to the best of your ability and done justice to whatever shenanigans you happened to get up to last night. Uh, our book today is a collection of lesser-known stories by Sheridan Le Fanu and is Madame Crowell's Ghosts and other stories compiled and collected by M.R. James. Uh, before we come on to that, we do have the business, obviously, of our word of the day. This is a, isn't one that I found from today's book. It actually comes from um, a word game that I play on my phone, and it is Taus, or Taus, I believe it's pronounced Taus, which is to rumple or to ruffle or to tangle or what did I put down here? Uh, disarrange or treat roughly. It comes from an old German word uh, which was first coined as a verb in 1598 and was then later used as a noun as well from about 1795 onwards. So again if you're looking for an alternative to any of those other words I listed there, there you go. Taus. I don't know how you'd use it in your own writing I mean, possibly from the descriptions that I was reading there, to treat roughly, maybe if they'd have had it back in the ancient world, a certain Mr. Pilot might have used it with reference to a particularly obstinate Jew by the name of Brian. Strike him, St. Julian, very roughly! Ah! Well, before we come on to the book itself, do my usual, we'll do my bullet point biography. We have Joseph Thomas Sheridan Le Fanu, born in Dublin in August 1814. Uh, his family kind of epitomised the literary family. His grandmother Alicia Sheridan Le Fanu and also his great uncle Richard Brinsley Sheridan were both playwrights. His mother Emma was also a writer and a biographer. His niece Rhonda Bridgeton, Bridgeton? Broughton, excuse me, was a novelist in her own right. His father Thomas was a clergyman and a member of the Church of Ireland and his family were Huguenot by descent. He studied law at Trinity College in Dublin where he lived and spent most of his life and was called to the bar in 1838 although he never actually served or worked as a barrister instead preferring to pursue a career in journalism. But I don't know. It's one of those spooky things, obviously. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh yeah, also in 1838 saw the publication of his first work of fantastical literature, which was called The Ghost and the Bone Setter, which appeared in the Dublin University Magazine, a periodical that Le Fanu would go on later in life to actually owning, in addition to a number of other periodicals and papers, including The Protestant Guardian, The Evening Packet, The Warder, the Statesman and the Dublin Evening Mail. In 1844 he married Susanna Bennett who was the daughter of a prominent Dublin barrister and together they had four children, two boys, two girls, Eleanor, Emma, Thomas and George. In 1856 the family moved to the house that had been vacated by Fanu's in-laws in Merrion Square. The building itself still survives to this day and is actually the home of the Irish Arts Council. Uh, his wife Susanna suffered from a progressive kind of neurological disorder and she passed away in the April of 1858 uh, after a bout of hysteria. While the reasons for this have, were never really kind of discovered, it's generally believed that this stemmed from uh, a bout of anxiety that she was experiencing following the death of several of her own close relatives in quite a short succession of each other. Not surprisingly, the death of his wife hit Le Fanu quite hard, and as a result, he didn't produce any new works of fiction until 1861, following the death of his own mother. Sheridan Le Fanu died at the age of 58 on the morning of Monday the 7th 
of February 1873 in his home in Dublin. Several of the sources I looked at, um, some of the basic ones all say that his cause of death was a heart attack, but I did find in researching this, this quite touching letter that was written by his daughter Emma to Lafanu's cousin Frederick Temple Blackwood, who was the first Marquis of Dunfermline, and Ava, or Ava, sorry if I got that wrong, in which she says that he died quietly in his sleep whilst fighting off a particularly pernicious bout of bronchitis. During the course of his life he wrote upwards of 20 novels and easily as many novellas and short stories and is particularly known for his work in terms of ghost stories, fantastical literature, but also wrote a number of his novels were sensationalist novels, very much in the style of Wilkie Collins. Amongst his most famous works are things like Uncle Silas, The House by the Churchyard, and one of his early collections, In a Glass Darkly, which included the story Carmilla, which uh, probably more, probably, mm. I don't know, it's hard to say. Uncle Silas is probably the, his work that's been repeated and anthologised and dramatised more than any. Carmilla is probably the nearest one, having appeared in film and on TV several times, notably in the Hammer horror film The Vampire Lovers, and is also noted as well as being the inspiration for another Irishman who wrote something about a vampire. But I mean, who knows anything about that? <laughs> Well, I did find, well, again, doing my research for this, uh, there was a lovely little anecdote from the British-American uh, writer Henry James, in which he noted that it was a Victorian custom for uh, hosts to leave a small volume of Le Fanu's works on the bedside table of their guests, with the caveat, for the hours after midnight. Delicious. So, looking at the, uh, the blurb from the book itself, Madame Crowell's Ghosts and Other Stories are tales selected from Le Fanu's stories which mostly appeared in the Dublin University magazine and other periodicals and their haunting sinister qualities still have an enormous appeal for the modern reader. The great M.R. James, who collected and introduces the stories in this book, considered that Le Fanu stands absolutely in the first rank of writers of ghost stories. So the book itself contains a collection of 12 of Le Fanu's lesser known stories. There should be a list of those on screen now. You'll also note as well, and it was something that I, I must admit was a bit of a surprise to me, because I expected these to have come from like some of his early works, but as you can see, I've also included the dates when the first stories first appeared. Many of them do come from the tail end of Le Fanu's career. I think partly of that is in the, in the introduction, M.R. James does say that he had quite a bit of job tracking some of these stories down, because most of the periodicals that they appeared in were no longer extant. I do say 12 stories, that's actually not quite true, because two of the stories in here actually contain more than one story, which is kind of really nice. They're, they're kind of like, um, <laughs> it's like an anthology within an anthology, if you like. Obviously not in the same vein as, say, the story within story motif that makes up so much of, um, what was I thinking of the other day? The manuscript found in Saragossa, which is very much like that. You have your protagonist meets somebody who tells them a story, and then somebody in that story tells a story, which is... that's a whole other level of headache. We'll make them onto that one someday. But yes, two of the works in here. Ghost Stories from Chapel Ezod, and also the last story, which I can never remember the name of, which was Tales from... Oh, Stories from Lothgwyr. Le Fanu takes the point of view of a narrator who is talking to somebody from these areas who recounts some of the local legends and folklore, which he's collated in those stories. Which is kind of quite nice because it kind of makes you feel like you're, you're getting a little bit extra for, for, for your dollar, if you like. Certainly the ghost stories of Chapalazod is an interesting one because Chapalazod itself is a real place. It was, it's a small village about four miles outside of Dublin. It was quite close to where Le Fanu spent part of his childhood. It's also interesting to note that the village is also the setting for his novel uh, The House by the Churchyard. Certainly with some of the first stories that appear in this, and I'm only assuming that the, it's because these were written for the kind of the periodical circuit of, of the day that in some of them you do get a slight repetition of turn of phrase and things like that but again at the same time that could equally just be an affectation of the author who knows it's just something i noticed while i was reading them it's not something that detracts at all from, from any of the stories so each of the stories in here is a fine example of the later gothic style and they all contain this wonderfully sort of generous use, if you like, of the D 
descriptive and, and, and haunting style for which he was known. You can almost follow the um, the breadcrumbs that leading back to uh, his own love of the earlier gothic styles, especially the works of the likes of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Walter Scott and Radcliffe, and Emmanuel Swedenborg. The tales themselves are clearly targeted at the Irish newspaper reader of the day. That kind of comes through not only in the types of stories that are in here, but also in Le Fanu's use of colloquialisms, as well as, as I said, place settings, things like that. Uh, and I'm really pleased that M.R. James hasn't made any effort to kind of remove those when collecting the works. When gathered together like this, they present, if you like, a, a celebration of the kind of the rich history that Ireland has with, with the fantastical. I was particularly pleased with how easily he embraces his homeland's connection with, with the Fae. And this is referenced in, in, in several of the stories, even if in just like a small way, but obviously comes to the fore in, in the story that's quite simply entitled The Boy That Went With The Fairies. Again, as I say, it's just a nice little touch in there and it makes it feel more, I don't know, quintessentially Irish, shall we say. This also demonstrates how much, as well as a writer, he wasn't afraid to colour and embellish his characters by giving them like regional accents or turns of phrase. But he does that in such a way that they actually, as I said, embellish and add depth to the character rather than taking away from it and purely defining the character by how they talk. Uh, I thought that, that was quite nice. And again, as I said, it's another example of, of his talent as a writer. But also on display here is his talent for adding uh, moments of levity to the works as well that goes a long way to complementing the, the horror and the creeping dread if you like that so typified both early gothic as well as uh, victorian gothic as well which is really nice he knows just where to put it in without it overshadowing or destroying any of the atmosphere that he worked so hard to build whilst researching this i did find a couple of articles that i thought were quite interesting and there's just one in particular i'd like to read just a couple of lines out which they say in in clearer words than i probably can uh, so this is taken from a website called the victorian web and this is from an article written by simon cook phd editor of book illustration and design not sure when this was written but he's just a couple of things that he makes note of with regards to lefanu uh, foremost amongst these is his representation of the liminal space between psychological conditions and the supernatural making it difficult to judge the origins of what often appear to be otherworldly visions. Indeed, one of his main strengths is his capacity in, to infuse the normal with a sense of menace, infecting the ordinary with anxiety as characters of uncertain significance engage with the guileless. Last bit here, his capacity to create these uncanny situations infused the genre with great psychological intensity. A lot of this is in evidence here in these stories. Before I go on to like, my final thoughts and to kind of looking at the stories, you know, which of the stories I kind of would highly recommend, I'm going to do my usual thing. I'm going to go and disappear and do my eyes. Where are we? Oh! Wow. We are finished the first page. Well, we will do it in a minute. So, yeah, while I go and do that. I suppose I should really say, I'll be right back. Let's have a look. Where are we? Okay, so, um, what can I say about the collection? I think it's a good collection. A good introduction to Le Fanu's works. Of all of the stories that are in here, I think about the only one that I... I don't want to go so far as to say I had a problem with you. I think the only one that I kind of like struggled with slightly is one of the later stories called Ulthor de Lacey. There's nothing wrong with the story. It just... It's just, it's longer than it needed to be, I think. I think it was my problem with it. It did feel like it sort of outstayed its welcome a little, which is a shame. But then at the same time, uh, Lefanu was one of those guys who was known to either um, repurpose or extrapolate ideas from some of his short stories and rework them into longer works. And I do wonder if that was the case 
with that particular story because it feels a bit disjointed in places and I do wonder if it was like a work in progress. As it turns out, uh, as I think I did mention when we did the movie version of it, was the case with uh, The Duel. That was the basis for what was supposed to be the longer work that Conrad was going to produce and then never did. But yeah, I do, I do wonder if, if that's the case with that particular story. Of the others, uh, if I were to kind of give you a like a top three, if you like, the ones I really enjoyed the most. At number three, I would put the one I talked about earlier, the ghost stories of Chapelizod. They're, they're really nice and they're all very different and again, show this kind of rich tapestry of fantastical tales associated with just this one small village. There's three stories in there in total, all very different with very little in terms of overlap, but they all work really, really well. And again, there's the wonderful examples of this kind of lightness of touch and just a little sense of levity, as I said, interspersed amongst the more horrific elements that, that uh, he presents. And again, with a lot of Le Fanu's works, they are ghost stories, they are psychological, they are horror. It is, that, again, that creeping dread. It's not very much gore-based, if you like, which is just, again, wonderful. In second place, shall we say, I would put the second story in here, it's Squire Toby's Will. This one is, is, is wonderful and it's replete with early gothic concepts and conventions. And there's also almost a, um, there's an almost a Dickensian element to it, which I really enjoyed. This idea of something from, from beyond the grave attempting to atone for wrongs within their life, but at the same time having to trust to the rather narrow-minded concepts and conceptions of the living to enact this act of atonement. It works really well and it is a fantastic haunted house ghost story. Definitely, definitely recommend it. But I think the one that I enjoyed the most, and I'm going to have to read it out because it's quite a long one, he was very much known for his longer titles. An account of some strange disturbances in Anguir Street. This is another haunted house tale of a couple of college students in Dublin renting rooms in this abandoned house and what befalls them during their stay there. And it's really nice, It's there's, there's a lovely mystery element to it. We see things from one of the characters, our, our, our narrator's point of view, and then we see the other half of the story when he gets a chance to discuss what's happened to his housemate it, and it's wonderful also some of the stuff in it is very reminiscent and i would be interested to know and if anybody does know if this was either inspired by or the inspiration for a number of other ghost stories in particular uh, the likes of uh, the judge's house the rats in the walls uh, and also the gray house as well all have similar themes and concepts and, and, and tropes as as this particular story it works works really really well and i really enjoyed it it's another one again in fact any of those three are ones that i will throw open to my friends in the audio horror circuit in particular jasper and ian from encrypted and horror babble respectively be interested to see if either of you would want to give them a look and, and what you do with them because they are wonderful tales and again on that note very quickly sorry thank you to Ian uh, from Horror Babble for the shout out that you gave us recently and for reading out The House That Remembered, which was one of the stories that I mentioned when I did my review of the 27th Pan Book of Horror Stories. So Ian, you are a gentleman. Thank you. Overall though, would I recommend this collection of work? Yeah, yeah, I think I would. As I mentioned earlier, it's a good introduction because of where these originally appeared. I would class them as Le Fanu Light. I think he has written better stuff than what's in here. But if you've never read his works and you want to get into it, this is a good place to start. If you want to know like more of his best stuff, the ones that I mentioned there earlier, unfortunately things like Uncle Silas and The House by the Churchyard I only know by repute. The ones that I can, from personal experience, that I can definitely recommend would be a Green Tea uh, and the one that really kind of introduced me to Le Fanu, which is of a strange occurrence in the life of Shark and the Painter. It's probably the one that I know best, which is wonderful. It may even still be available on YouTube for free. Is There was a BBC dramatisation of it from the 70s, which is very good and I can highly recommend. But read the story as well. But as an introduction, yeah, I think you should give this one a look. Just realised that I've forgotten to say anything about the product itself, which is obviously one of the things that I do rate these things on. 
This is another one of the uh, Wordsworth Classic Editions. I've got another one of these from somebody else as well, which is kind of quite nice, you know, I do like cover art's nice and it's all, you know, it's a fine and serviceable paperback. I wouldn't, you know, say there's anything particularly special about it, but aesthetics, you know, is a thing, apparently. Yeah, and again, as always, thank you to my friend Simon Morgan for giving me this copy uh, and giving us a chance to dive into a bit more Sheridan. So let's have a look at our eyes, shall we? Oh, I'm gonna need a new pen. Uh, we are, oh, yeah, do that in a second. So uh, for this one, I've gone with a two eye for the product. It's okay. I don't have any particularly strong feelings about it. A three eye for the stories. I enjoyed them. They're good. They're good examples of Lafanu's work. But as I say, I think there is better out there in some of his longer form work. Uh, and as I have the book out, we will go straight to the list. There it is. And we have laid those ghosts to rest. And we will look at what we're going to be doing next. Or what are we doing next? What I'm going to be reading next. This one was another recommendation. And this one was a recommendation from my good friend Sam, who thought I might enjoy this after my reading of Day of the Locust, which I've covered quite early on in this series, and he thought this particular book presents some similar but more kind of contemporary ideas and approaches to a similar kind of thing, and that is Cold Heart Canyon by Clive Barker. Obviously we've already looked at Mr Barker's work with the Books of Blood, again on a previous episode, which means that at least my biography bit should be a bit shorter. Looking forward to this one, I have an odd kind of, sort of relationship with Barker's works. Some of them I really love and some of them just kind of like, meh, the magic I'm looking at you. But yeah, so we will see what this has to give. So I'm going to take my cold slab of book find myself a cold niche, maybe serve myself a platter of cold cuts, and I'm not sure how many other cold references I can get into this outro, so I'm simply going to say, get thee gone. They're always after me, lucky charms. So we will be going back to an author that we've already covered in this series, uh, the great Help me! <laughs>